Hello guys and welcome to another Minotaur Zombie Review slash Thoughts. This time on Vagrant Story for the PlayStation 1. Now this will be a spoiler free review, I won't be saying anything outside of, you know, the intro and maybe the first couple hours or so. This was a unique little RPG gem made by Square, kind of towards the end of the PlayStation 1's life. You play as Ashley Riot, who's a risk breaker. The risk breakers are kind of like special agents who go in alone, kind of like a James Bond type. Ashley is sent in to investigate a connection between one of the Dukes and his connection with a cult known as Mullenkamp, led by Sydney. What ensues? This is... Square is like the king of this. I love this intro so much. It gets you so pumped to play the game, and it just jams so much in your face. First of all, you sneak in and you kill a few guards and you come in, and you see Sydney, who immediately, you catch him off guard and you have a bow gun aimed at him. And he lunges at you and you shoot a bow gun straight through his heart. And as you're looking at the pieces of this scattered manor, Sydney gets back up. The giant wyvern comes down and you gotta fight this giant wyvern as Sydney escapes. It's just, it's, it's a bombastic intro that really gets you involved in this story right away. It reminds me a lot of like Final Fantasy VII with how that intro just got me into that game. The funny thing about this game is that it is kind of a dungeon crawly game mixed a little bit with Metroid as far as backtracking and areas are concerned. And yet, despite it being a dungeon crawly game, there is a lot of story here, and it is surprisingly good. After the encounter at the manor, Ashley follows Sydney to a ruined city of Le Monde, which was devastated by an earthquake years and years and years ago. It's kind of an abandoned city now, and you follow him there to learn the truths about what the heck is going on, how he was able to survive getting shot with an arrow right in the chest, get right back up like it was no big deal, and maybe encounter some exciting revelations about Ashley himself. Now one of the great things this story does is it foreshadows you right away. What's occurring in Le Monde is like a flashback. They tell you Ashley is being charged with the crime of murdering the Duke, and you play the week-long events leading up to that. And why, you know, how could that happen? Because Ashley's a royal, loyal risk breaker to the kingdom. Why would he kill the Duke? It's a story that deals a lot with politic kind of stuff, which as a kid I wouldn't have liked very much. It's why I didn't like the Final Fantasy Tactics story that much as a kid. But now that I'm older, I love this kind of plot. And it's so cool to me. In fact, if you liked Final Fantasy Tactics-y kind of plot, you're probably going to really like this one too. One thing I love about this game's plot is that a lot of the things about it are left a little bit open to interpretation. They never, there's a few aspects that they never concrete, concretely say, you know, it is this or this. You know, it's kind of left open up to your thoughts a little bit. And I know some people don't like that as much, especially the ending is really left open to interpretation as far as, you know, what happens a little bit. But I absolutely love it. In fact, as much as I really like this game, and I'll get into that, I don't know if I'd ever want to see a sequel to this either, because I really like how the story ended. Even though it didn't tie everything up in a nice ribbon, it felt right to end it the way it did. And I really, really enjoyed this story. Now as I said earlier, this is kind of a dungeon crawly game. What that means is that you're going room by room, killing a lot of enemies, and uh, grabbing loot. There are a few things that set this game apart from that. One thing is that you never directly level up, more so occasionally when you'll beat enemies, you'll get potions that'll increase some of your stats, which, yes, the stat ups seem a little bit random, and for the perfectionists out there, this is gonna bug the crap out of you, but rest assured, it, well, strength, you know, strength numbers can make quite a bit of difference in this game, you never have to worry, like, you're dealt an impossible situation you can't overcome because you didn't get the right stat ups. In fact, every time you beat a boss enemy, you'll get a roulette wheel which will give you a random stat up. What's far more important though is your equipment. There is this, this game clearly really wants you to delve into a crafting system and you really have to look at your equipment. The reason I'm getting into this before the gameplay is because a lot of the gameplay is managing your equipment well. This game, while this game doesn't directly have level ups, it instead opts for a unique system that I don't, can't think of any other game that's really utilized. So 
your equipment has all these different stats, uh, whether it's, you know, what attribute, like is it, is it a fire element, or is it just a regular physical attack, is it bladed, edged, or, or is it edged, blunt, or piercing, you know, that stuff as a whole isn't unique to, you know, RPG mechanics, but what is, is that you train these weapons to be what you want. So if you're hitting a water enemy, for example, you will be raising your weapon's fire affinity to make it a fire attribute weapon. If you are hitting a certain enemy type, the weapon's enemy class will go up, and so you'll do slightly more damage to that type of enemy. And on the flip side, striking, you know, as my fire element would go up, the water element goes down too. No, doesn't seem to go down nearly as much as how it rises, but in essence, it's almost like the game wants you to switch out weapons and build up a bunch of different weapons for the scenario. And this is no more evident than a few hours in when you get to that, you know, you'll get to a boss in this game, and it will be a wake-up call boss. This is, an RP this is not an RPG for beginners. I should have prefaced this <laughs> at the beginning. Uh, this is definitely an RPG for the more hardcore players. You can you can play it if you're a beginner, but it's not a if you're if you already if you're already not really into RPGs, this game is definitely not gonna make you change your mind. You'll get to a boss, and it might not be the same boss as me, but you'll get to a boss where all of a sudden you'll you're whacking on it with your favorite weapon, and you'll be doing like one or two damage with every swing. The enemy will do like a flame breath and you'll be like one shot and you're like, what the heck? How am I supposed to beat this? The way you do it is you gotta really mess with your equipment well. If you're essentially this means trying to strike a balance between having the right weapon for the right situation and trying to have an overall weapon for, you know, a variety of situations. And early on, if you're trying to hit a boss enemy with a weapon that it's strong against, you're gonna do next to no damage, and you're gonna have a really rough time. And the same with your armor. If your armor is, you know, doesn't have good flame resistance against the fire guy, you're gonna be toast. Now, the only problem I have with this system is that the menus in this game are frustratingly cumbersome frustratingly so and to be honest everything that i just explained to you there's like no in-game tutorials everything that i just explained to you is some of the really obscure complex mechanics that this game just does not do a good job of explaining to you there is an in-game like help digital help manual i guess you could say like a lot of games do nowadays that is kind of like prerequisite re reading i would say before really diving into this game spend 15 20 minutes at least read through the I think there's one section called Read Me. At least read through that section so you understand the basic mechanics, because otherwise you will be so lost, and you will get so frustrated when you start doing like one to two damage on enemies, and they're just like destroying you. But like I said, it's like they want you to swap out weapons and build up so you have a water weapon or a fire weapon or maybe a spear for piercing. The problem is the menus are so frustratingly cumbersome. Frustratingly so. Uh, even attaching gems, which is really how I got by the system. I actually had a general purpose weapon and, and I got through it by attaching the right gems for the right situation by raising my affinities, my elementals up high enough. Because uh, funnily enough, you can have like a 50 in all your elementals, but if you have a 51 in one of them, it's only take, it only factors in whatever's the highest. So you could have like an ice, a weapon that has a really good ice affinity, but if anything's higher than it, it's not ice at all. Or, well, actually ice isn't even an affinity, we'll say water. Anyway, it's it's a frustratingly complex system, and there's just so little is explained to you. For example, class seems to matter very little, but affinity and weapon type is a huge difference. The menu system and even the crafting system is just so complex, you gotta attach a grip and a blade together to make a weapon, or you can combine weapons together, but it's also frustratingly cumbersome. I rarely did it because so many of the outcomes I was getting was like, worse equipment. There was one time it made a super shield that stuck with me through the end of the game. That shield was amazing. But for the most part, it's really frustrating and I just could not find myself really digging into it deep. I will say though, that despite everything I just said, it is satisfying to prepare yourself for a boss encounter, scan the boss, and see what he's weak against, and prepare for that. Now that, I'm, now that I've got that section done with the gameplay overall, it is interesting. So, you have two different modes. You have regular run-around mode and combat mode. And when you're in combat mode, you 
you can hit your attack button to bring up a circle attack area, which fans of Parasite Eve would recognize pretty quickly. Essentially, if an enemy's in there, you can hit him. And you'll have a few different places to hit, actually. You can hit their head, their arms, body, legs, or, you know, other tail, if it's a wyvern, all sorts of different things. Attacking these will disable some special moves, uh, from what the manual told me, and some other things. For the most part, it's... Not only is it really cumbersome to see what the health of each particular body part is, it's just... It never seemed to have that much of an effect to me to try and break appendages. And so, what you quickly do is you look at... And, and, each, and each appendage will have different resistances and weaknesses. So what I did is they kind of give you a percent chance to hit and a, you know, a, de a rough damage number. And so you quickly just like scroll through, okay, that one's the highest, best chance to hit, like risk to reward ratio, and you go off of that. But once you strike an enemy, after the first boss, you gain an option to do chains. And I can only really liken this to if you guys have played a Paper Mario game or any kind of like timing based game, you'll have an exclamation point point up here above your head and what you want to do is press one of three face buttons to basically keep a combo going and as long as you can time it right you can keep this combo going forever the three different you know the three different face buttons all correspond to different chain combos that you set beforehand uh, you can you can't do the same one twice in a row but you can go like you know chain one then chain three then one then two however you want to do it risk involved in this is that by doing this, you'll quickly raise your risk meter, which increases any time you attack or do anything like that. The risk meter is what gets so interesting in this game. So as your risk goes up, you have a lower percent chance to hit, but a higher critical hit ratio, and you take more damage from the enemies. This is, It's significant. I mean, you really feel the effects. The risk meter goes from 0 to 100, and even 0 to 20, you can definitely tell the difference in your not only in your hit ratio but how much damage you take in. the same goes for how much your cure spell does to you so if you're at high risk your cure spell does more and there is magic but that's all you know the magic i never found that useful well no i should i should <laughs> the attacking magic i never found useful all of the buffing magic allowed me to kind of cheese my way through this game without really dealing with the weapon swapping constantly to try and build different ones but the risk is an interesting mechanic because to have it lower really fast you have to put your weapons away which means you know if you're not using a two-handed weapon that means you put your shield away which drastically lowers your defense or you have to use items to get it back down so if you want to go ham and just try and chain an enemy to death you can and it is an effective strategy but if you mess up you might leave yourself with high risk and potentially in a position to just get one-shotted by the enemy it's a really unique system that I really enjoyed, except for a few things. The only time I didn't enjoy it was towards the end of the game, mostly due to my strats of cheesing. I wouldn't bother switching weapons and I'd hack away at them with like 5 damage per swing, which would really rack up my risk by the end of the room, leaving me at like 80 risk. And then what I have to do is put my weapon away and sit there for like 30 seconds while I wait for my risk to go back down to zero before entering the next room, and that could happen quite a bit. Overall, if you're not good at timing games, you don't have to worry that much. Like I said, so much of the skill in this game is just preparing for the challenge at hand. To be honest, it's it's just satisfying. It clicked with me. There are frustrating things about it. I do hate this menu. It This is the type of game where if it, if it could get an HD re-release or some kind of re-release, fixing these minor, like, just a... Because they have so many shortcuts. There's some menu things that are great, like the shortcut menu in the game. But... The weapon switching and messing with inventory stuff is so cumbersome, especially since they give you so few slots, you will constantly have to do inventory management and throw out old things as you go through the game. They give you a storage box, but this is one of the weirdest things to me ever. So that I believe this game takes three blocks of storage on a memory card, which is a lot for a PS1 memory card. That's one fifth of your entire memory card dedicated to this game for one save file. And what happens is if you want to store more items, you have to go to a storage box, 
I can only assume that this game is pushing to the PS1's limits so hard that it cannot hold all your your regular inventory list in RAM at all times, and that's why it's so limited. Because when you go to the storage box, it has to load your saved game, and then brings up the rest of your slots, and then it has to save again when you're done. So I think it can only populate so many <laughs> items in your inventory at a time, and then it, if you want to if you want to store things, it has to load from your memory card and remember the rest of your stuff. It's so strange. Overall, the gameplay is interesting. Now, there are also block puzzles in this game, and it's probably the worst part about the gameplay to me. None of the block puzzles are particularly really challenging, although they're just so boring. There's a few different block types, but for the most part, they're just wholly very uninspired, and I just really couldn't be bothered to, to really mess with them and play with them much. I I, lo I would look up a few solutions online because I'm like, wow, I accidentally jumped off this platform, but I gotta get back up and I have to solve a block puzzle. I, I'm really not feeling this. So that's that could drag the game down at times. It, they, they're not frequent. They, they actually happen a lot more towards the end of the game. In fact, a lot of times you'll see blocks in a room making you think you need to do a block puzzle, but there's no puzzle to solve in there. They just felt like putting the blocks in there, which is just weird. As I said earlier, the game is structured almost kind of like a Metroid game, where everything is this big interconnected world, and it can be a bit overwhelming at times as you're running back and forth between areas and you'll get a new key to go back and visit an old one. It, it can be a bit overwhelming. Luckily, there's usually a path ahead, and it isn't too obscure. There's only one or two times where I was like, I, I feel like I went off the rails and now I have to look at the map and figure it out. Luckily, the map is awesome. Uh, it'll show you which rooms were locked in previous areas, and it'll show you if you, have, if you have the key or not, and you can unlock it. This is further helped by a teleportation spell you get. It's really late into the game, probably three-fourths of the way in. But once you get that, it's really handy because you can quickly warp between any save point uh, as long as you're standing on one. Now, the areas that you'll explore in this game are actually fairly diverse, although... I gotta say, the first area that I go into after the intro was probably my least favorite and a little drab. But as you get out of that place, there's so much more to explore, and it feels really great. Overall, the gameplay, I enjoyed it. It has a few things about it that really hold it back from being one of my all-time favorite classic games. And there is a new Game Plus feature for those of you who enjoy that. I suppose you could probably raise your stats a lot more. I mean, I, I'm not kidding when I say you're, you know, Ashley himself does not level up through much throughout the game. I mean, this is like starting stats. This is my stats at the end of the game for HP and MP. I don't even think it doubled. No, I, as I, when I look at that video footage, I'll be shocked at how little it went up. Especially the MP. Which is frustrating because teleport spell takes MP based on how far away it is. That's another, uh, another nitpick. Also, the save times are offensively long. But... The music in this game is phenomenal. It is by the same composer as the Final Fantasy Tactics games, and I could tell it right away if you love that style of, like, grand... I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. Like, grand orchestrated music of, like, blaring trumpets and kind of this regalness to it. It's, it's just so well done. As always, I've been playing my favorite tracks from the game throughout the review, and, uh... Man, some of the boss... It, it's... <laughs> It plays during the fight called Wyvern, or I, the fight against Wyvern, but there's a different track called Wyvern, so it's hard to track it down. But that one is, oh, I love that battle theme, that boss theme. It is so good. Oh, and the graphics in this game. I, I have to talk about these. Now, these look a little bit better because I'm playing through EPSXE, which makes everything look a little bit sharper. But even without that, this game looks absolutely phenomenal for the PS1. It is unreal how detailed these these character models are especially some of these enemies like the giant dragons and looks and and the load times aren't even that bad it shocks me and, and one of the most impressive things to me and i i think a lot of people if you're a newer gamer you won't understand this as much but a lot of these cutscenes are done in engine which is just something that we didn't get a lot of or if they they were in engine there was very minimal movement and characters just kind of standing at each other. This game, the camera is panning around as, can as characters are talking to each other. 
there almost every I think there's an FMV at the beginning of the game you know like when you first put it up before you hit new game but everything else is done in engine and it is done it's it's just impressive to see that it's a smooth transi transition from talking to like we go into battle like it's there's no fade to black here it's just a really impressive looking game I know it doesn't look like much nowadays but man if I would have played this back in the PS1 days my face would have melted. Anyway, that's Vagrant Story, guys. I, I do hope you give this one a look. Uh, it is not for the faint of heart. If you're not an RPG person, you probably not like this game. But if you are, there's a surprisingly in-depth story for a dungeon crawly game like this. A large degree of customization with the weapons. And if, if you like playing, playing with the weapons and preparing for a battle, this game is gonna fit your needs just fine. It's just such a unique game for the PS1. It's, I believe it's available on PSN. Uh, a physical copy actually isn't that, isn't that expensive. I found mine for 20 bucks at a local game store, which for this being the cult classic like I always hear about it, I thought it'd be a lot more. If, you, if this seems interesting to you guys, definitely check it out. Until next time, thank you so much for watching. Later everyone.